When he comes convince the world. And when he comes, he shall convince the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, that they do not believe in me, of righteousness, that I go to the Father, and you see me no more, of judgment, that the prince of this world is condemned. John 16 verses 8 to 11 What does that mean? Is not sin already chastened and condemned in the world? Who doesn't know that it is wrong to break the marriage, murder, steal and rob? Have not the Gentiles themselves forbidden and punished such things? Why ye then, do you need the Holy Ghost to convince of sin? What kind of sin is he referring to when he says they don't believe in him? Shouldn't he convince of other sins? Answer, he does not actually talk about what the world calls sin and punishes as such, as he clearly shows precisely in these words, that they do not believe in me. For who has ever heard that the sin that judges the whole world should be that, not to believe in this Christ? Therefore, this is sin and conviction of sin as something completely different from what the world understands and can talk about. For when he declares that this conviction of sin shall befall the whole world, all men in general, without distinction and without exception, whoever one is, it follows that the sin of which the Holy Spirit is to convince is of a different kind from the manifest sins which the world may confess. After all, they cannot be demonstrated in everyone, since many people live a spotless and immaculate life, and the world must praise them as pious, honorable, even holy people who not only abstain from sin, but also practice a righteous, honorable way of life and in good deeds. But if you ask what kind of sin they have, what it is they need to be convinced of, Christ answers, that they do not believe in me. In short, it says what it is that makes them all sinners and condemns them. It all sums up to one, that they are outside of faith in Christ or the realization of him. It is, frankly, to enclose everything under sin, so that one does not have to look and ask long for what or what kind of sins the individual should be convinced of, or how many or large and small sins there are. There you have in one word that the only thing that is demonstrated in all and is the sin of the whole world is that they are outside of Christ or do not have faith in him. Therefore, in short, the meaning of these words is for the Holy Spirit to pass the judgment that all men are and remain under the wrath and condemnation of God, no matter who and where they are in the world, whether they are Gentiles or Jews, guilty or unpunished in the eyes of the world, with all their lives and all their works, even with what they themselves consider the best, greatest, and holiest and that they cannot be saved from it unless they believe in Christ. Then let the one who can come and show his or others piety, virtues, good works, and holy way of life. Here you hear that it is worth nothing when the Holy Spirit blows over it and weathers it away with his breath, as Isaiah says one, that is, by means of this preaching office, for punishment strikes them all so that each and every one must let go of his own praise, and no merit in life and work benefits them with God. This is what he does through Paul at the beginning of Romans, Romans 1 18 ff, where he encloses both Jews and Gentiles under sin and says that the gospel is revealed from heaven so that the whole world may confess guilty to sin before God. There's no difference, he says, for all have sinned and have lost the glory of God, Romans 3 verse 23. With this, the self-praise and overconfidence of all human beings are knocked to the ground. In the world they may be praised and called mighty, noble, learned, fine, 
brilliant rulers, honest and pious people, even saints. So Paul also gives the Jews the praise and advantage that they are God's people and children of the holy patriarchs, that they have God's law and promises, and that Christ is to be born in their people. But what is all that praise when you don't have the one you should have with God? When they don't have God, what do they have left but something eternally lost with themselves? Then you might say, well, why is that? What is missing since it does not apply to God? Is it all to be condemned that they are fine, venerable, pious men, rule well and praiseworthily, do not steal, rob, etc., but live honorably, decently and obediently, do many good deeds, and observe the law? Aren't these all God's good gifts and praiseworthy virtues? Answer, yes, indeed. We also say this and even learn that God commands this and wants you to be pious and live this way. Why, then, is it being revealed here as sin? Answer, here is another judge who judges the lives and lives of all people and has much sharper eyes to see and reveal sin than we humans understand or imagine we can. He says that everyone is a sinner and thus an accomplice. We should reasonably believe him, let him be right and successful. He also reveals this blindness of ours that we neither see nor acknowledge that with all our lives we are sinners before God. But you should know that here, as I have said, he is not talking about the external life and behavior of man, which the world can judge and judge, but he goes to the very heart of the matter, namely, the heart of man, which is the source and source of the real main sin, namely, false worship, contempt for God, unbelief, disobedience, evil desire, and opposition to God's commandments, in short, what Paul in Romans chapter 8 calls being carnal and gives the praiseworthy description, what the flesh wants is enmity with God, it does not submit to the law of God, nor can it, Romans 8 verse 7. This is the origin and root of all other sin, it is the very damage of Adam in paradise. If we did not have this basic damage, there would be no theft, murder, fornication, etc. Now the world can see all these external, evil things, yes, it wonders and complains that people are so mean. It just doesn't know how it's going to go. It certainly sees the brook flowing and sees everywhere the fruits and leaves of the evil tree, but where the source originates, and where the root is hidden, it does not know. Then it rushes forward and will make amends, will control evil and improve people by laws and punishments. But no matter how long you go about it, it doesn't help. They can damn the pelvis, but thus the main source is not stopped, the sprouts can be removed, but the root is still there. It is all in vain. There is no point in containing, improving and healing outwardly for as long as the stem, root and source of all evil is still there on the inside. Before everything else, the source must be clogged and the root of the tree removed, Otherwise it will gush and break out in ten places every time you stop one more hole and prevent one sprout from breaking out. For this reason, healing is needed, otherwise you can continue to scrape and lubricate and put plasters on the wound for all eternity. It keeps flowing and fluid, eating away and only getting worse.